here for Monday, April 15th. Um, Approve the agenda. Be the first thing on the list. Uh, are there any changes or additions? I'm pleased to add an outside consumption permit for landscape cooking. Under consent, consent agenda items. date with that, Carla, or no. just for this year, you mean? For the 2019. Go ahead, Bill. Um, I, I don't think you can actually add it to the consent agenda because it's being added. You have to, yeah. you have to, you have to specifically pick it up. So just, you can put it on there, but it can't be just consent agenda. You're going to have to have a specific issue to talk about that. She has to put it under the consent agenda, which Correct. means you automatically approve it if you approve the consent agenda. And you can't put it on the consent agenda, is what I'm telling you. You can add it to the agenda, but not put it on the consent agenda. Okay. So we're just going to add it to the agenda then. Let's add it after the um, entertainment permit. All right then, um, with that addition, would somebody like to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the modification. A second? Second that. Any further discussion? None. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Now we'll approve the consent agenda, which is just the minutes of the April 1st meeting. Is there a motion to approve that, please? Make a motion to approve that. A second? Second. Okay. All those who wish to approve it, say aye. 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 Public? Anybody here from the public wish to speak at this time? Everett? Yeah, basically, Anne probably wants me to mic, but. Yeah. <laughs> Anne wants to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anne, you have been here since April 1st. Under the public, uh, it's not a complaint, it's a concern. The meeting last week of the two state troopers that were supposed to be here, unfortunately they were both tied up on a emergency situations. There were five people in attendance, including Annie and myself, and we need somehow getting on WDEV, uh, their report in the morning of happenings or whatever, and I would think that maybe WDEV would give us a couple more shouts to encourage people to come and learn what the police are attempting to do and how safe we are and how well people are accepting, accepting the new changes from a former police department to real trained police officers. Okay. Questions? I'm not faulting anybody for that, but just we got to get out into the, into the back country and get people out here to come and listen. Thank you. That's probably as difficult to do something like that there, Everett, as it is to get them to come here. So <laughs> we'll do what we can. <laughs> okay. Um, nobody else from the public? We'll move on um, to committee reappointments. And there's a fair list of them. Start out with the first one, which is Mary Cohen, Planning Commission, re-up for a three-year term, ending uh, April 30th, 2022. Phoebe Pelkey for Recreation Committee for three-year term, ending in April 30th, 2022. Steve Hagenbach and Tracy Sweeney for Conservation Commission, each for a four-year term, ending April 30th, 2023. And then Barb Blavel and Jack Carter for the Tree Committee, uh, each for a three-year term, ending April 30th, 2022. Next is Steve Lott's speech, a tree warden for one year term ending April 30th, 2020. 
And again, Steve Lott speech, representative for Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission for a one year term. Is there a motion to approve those reappointments, please? I make a motion to approve the slate as presented. Second? Second that. Anybody wish to comment further? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Library director's quarterly update, I'll me. Is that not working over there? I it's believe it is, yep. Okay. I'm not sure you did some switching around. No, but you better do. Okay. Do I have to be real close to this? Yep. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. Almost got to eat it. <laughs> right into it, Ami. What? You gotta put your. Okay, is that good? Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for giving me some time on your agenda. I appreciate it. Um, some of you got some swag over there. We have some new magnets for the library. It gives patrons an easy way to keep track of our website and our hours and put it on your fridge when you get home. So, um, I wanted to give you some highlights from the first quarter of 2019. Um, I also have some statistics to share with you. I have a handout which I'll, I'll give you at the end um, that tells you, uh, gives you a look at the use of the library by taxpayers and community members um, for the first quarter. But first I just wanted to share some of the highlights with you of our work in January, February, and March. Probably the biggest uh, exciting thing um, that happened the first quarter was we launched some new content, new digital content for our, for our, um, our patrons. Uh, we launched a, a new service of audiobooks and ebooks that are downloadable that offers a much bigger collection of titles than the previous one. Um, and it was cheaper. <laughs> um, and we also launched something called uh, a RB Digital is the company an entertainment platform and that included um, movies, uh, television shows, uh, SAT prep test, the great courses, which some of you may have heard of, um, and indie flicks. So that entertainment package is now available to patrons um, on, a, on a sort of a pass basis. So they can get a pass for one of those services and use it as much as they like for one week, and then the pass expires. So, um, and the launch for that went pretty well. We've, of course, had some questions from people about how to get on it and how to use it, but for the most part, it's gone very smoothly. So we're excited about that. Uh, we are also adding, uh, you may be familiar with our passes. We have passes that patrons can borrow um, that get them either free or reduced entry into area attractions. And oh, this spring, uh, when sort of the season starts, uh, we are adding four new passes to area attractions for, um, for residents to borrow from the library. And those include the Montshire Museum, which is in uh, Norwich, Vermont, Shelburne Museum, Birds of Vermont uh, Museum, which is in uh, Huntington or Heinsburg, um, Huntington, um, the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, which is in Virgennes, and also uh, an organization called EEE Vermont, which offers uh, classes for senior citizens, workshops and lectures and things like that. Similar to OSHER, you might have heard of OSHER, but it's a different organization. So um, we also hosted again this year the AARP volunteers who do free tax uh, preparation, I guess you could say, for, uh, for folks who need, uh, who need it, uh, mostly senior citizens. Um, and they did a great job, and they, I think they helped 64 different people file their taxes this year. So it's a wonderful service that they provide. Um, they do it all on a volunteer basis, and we just provide the space, and we help them a little bit with the logistical things, but um, it's, it's great for patrons. Uh, and the, we also made tax forms available to people to walk in and get, as you probably know, both the state and the federal government are really pushing people to do their taxes online, and it's gotten harder and harder to get actual paper, paper forms, so we uh, made sure that we were able to help people with getting paper forms if they needed them. 
Um, also, that what happens in January every year is uh, all Vermont libraries are required to fill out and um, submit a very detailed and lengthy report about all sorts of things to the Vermont Department of Libraries. So that was completed in January. Uh, as far as programming, we have added two after-school programs per month uh, that we didn't add before. They're um, mostly craft projects for um, kids 8 to 11 to come in after school and do. Uh, we also have added a Saturday program once a month. Um, we're showing movies for families uh, to come in and watch. And we also have added um, several drop-in programs during the school breaks, both February and April, uh, for families that are looking for something fun to do with the kids during the school vacation. Um, I wrote and submitted two successful grant proposals uh, this quarter. One was uh, $1,200 for nine pairs of snowshoes. Um, we haven't purchased them yet, but they're coming. It's not, it's not snowshoe season yet, so we have some time. Um, and the other one is uh, $450 from the Vermont Department of Libraries, but it's really a federal grant funneled through them for um, one staff person one and a half staff persons to uh, attend a conference that's being held in Burlington this year. It's a, a national library conference for small and rural libraries. Um, and from everything I've heard, it's supposed to be a really excellent conference and we're excited that they're in Vermont this year. They rotate states every year. I think they're in Kansas next year. So, um, so the other thing I had been thinking about the fact that we have this generator in the building now, and you know, what is that going to mean if places, the, you know, place, people in town lose power? Um, it's possible that we would see uh, in the library we would see um, people coming in to use the computers, the bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I purchased a bunch of different charging cords, figuring that people are going to need to charge up their devices if they're without power for any length of time, and they're still trying to communicate with family and so on and so forth. So we now have the capacity to, um, to have people come in with their phones and their tablets and their whatevers, um, to, and even if they don't have their own charging cord with them, um, they, can, they can charge up their devices. So just trying to be prepared ahead of time. Uh, we trained and recruited and trained two new volunteers uh, during this first quarter. And they are um, mostly coming in once a week to uh, help us with shelving and some of the other sort of clerical type tasks that happen every day. Um, let's see. We are preparing for a new staff member, as you know, that was approved at town meeting uh, for us to add a 25 hour a week uh, patron services librarian. Um, so far, I have received um, 19 resume slash applications and pretty soon I'll be going through them and narrowing them down, uh, and we will proceed with interviews probably by the end of the month. So we're very excited about having some extra hands in the library for that. Um, some of you may have seen me at town meeting. I had a table uh, that I staffed during, during the town meeting full of all kinds of library information and enjoyed talking to folks, and I'm still new to the community, so I'm trying to find ways to make the library more visible and get to know people. Um, I had a handout at town meeting with um, some statistics on it, which I'll share that with you. You may have already seen it, but it was on, on the table there in the back. So this is just a nice visual snapshot of a couple of key statistics for the library. For, this was for the, the calendar year 2018. Um, along those lines, uh, working to integrate the library more deeply into the community, I have been attending uh, revitalize water, revitalizing Waterbury meetings as well as the Rotary uh, Club meetings, and I've become a member of both of those organizations. Well, the library has become a member, but I'm representing the library. Um, and I, I have found that a really nice way to, 
sort of put faces and names together and try to get to know people in town. So, um, so the capital campaign has a small amount of funds left from when this building was built. And um, uh, the staff and I have evaluated kind of the use of the space and how things are being used now that we're in this new building. Um, and we saw that uh, we needed some more flexibility and we needed some more um, furnishings. So uh, we came up with a proposal and it was approved by the, the commissioners and the friends of the library who actually sort of have the checkbook. Um, so th those two groups both uh, have to approve uh, spending. And we are in the process of receiving some new furnishings including um, another uh, work table upstairs uh, in the back of the library. We find that oftentimes all of the study spaces and tables are full and there's still people walking around looking for a place to sit with their laptop or have a brief meeting or so on. So we're trying to add some more sort of nooks and crannies along those lines. Um, we also bought two new uh, racks for holding DVDs and audiobooks because we are running out of room and I would like to expand those collections. Um, and in the youth area, we purchased a number of new uh, furnishings and storage bins for toys and puzzles and things uh, that we'll be purchasing just to kind of liven up the, the, the youth area and bring in some more um, seating options for people and a craft table that will be available whenever families come to the library. Uh, so we're kind of excited about that. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm sure you're aware those funds are restricted to use for, uh, I guess, long-term furnishing type of things, not for general library budget. So, um, The other thing that we did with uh, some of the capital campaign money as well as a $500 donation from a taxpayer and big library user is uh, we have ordered some additional blinds for mostly for ups upstairs where... Um, we love the sunshine when it comes in that building up there, but it does make it hard to sit at that, the, the um, table outside of my office um, on a sunny day and uh, can't, you can't see a screen because the sun is so bright. So we worked with the same uh, outfit that did all the rest of the blinds in the library and, um, and those will be installed within the next few weeks, I believe. So, um, so now I'd like to turn to telling you just a couple of things about some programs that we had in the first quarter. Um, I'm going to focus on a couple of adult programs this time. And maybe another time I'll tell you about some children's programs. One of the um, services we pro provide the community is one-on-one uh, -on -one tech help sessions. Um, and th these are done by our, our tech librarian, Delia Gillen. And she makes herself available on an appointment basis uh, three days a week uh, when she's here. Um, and she sits down with people one-on-one -on -one and helps them with a whole range of, of technology questions. Um, so this, just this last month uh, in March, I wanted to illustrate for you the range of some of the things that she helps people with. She helped an artist submit her application for an art show. She helped a writer submit a children's novel to several different publishers. Um, she helped a local businesswoman get her business listed on Google. She helped another patron organize her computer files. Who doesn't need that, right? And she helped um, a senior citizen figure out how to play a Tai Chi DVD on her laptop so that she could practice at home. Another program that we had, let me back up a little bit. Um, Vermont Humanities Council sponsors a statewide reading program every year. And what they do is they select a book that appeals to a wide age range, and then they provide grants to libraries to um, fund multiple copies of the books that can be kept in the community. So in other words, we give them away uh, to people. And um, they also support, uh, they also provide uh, support for PR and programming around the book, of all, all different kinds of programs. So um, our adult facilitator, Judy Byron, this year again applied and received for this grant in 2019. Um, and this year, the book is March, Volume 1. I brought a copy of it for you to see. 
Um, it's a graphic novel, which if you, if you uh, don't know, graphic novels are basically very long story length comic books. And um, this was written by Senator John Lewis, who was one of the big six of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And so this is his, it's actually three volumes. The first volume is the one that we are focusing on for Vermont Reads. So one of the programs in this series that we're doing around this book is, was a um, talk entitled A History of the Concept of Race uh, with a man named William Ed Edelglass. I think I'm saying that right. And I'm just going to read you what uh, Judy wrote about the program after, afterwards. She said, we had 17 community members come. The talk was fascinating. Participants were attentive. Questions were interspersed throughout. And at its conclusion, many shared their experience with race and racism. Attendees stayed late to continue talking. And what grew out of this was a general consensus of wanting to meet again <clears throat> to continue discussion of this important topic. William told us after the workshop that our group was the most sincere post-talk he had ever encountered. And Judy commented to me that she was, she was really floored by how, um, how open people were about discussing their, you know, their experience with uh, racism and, and race in Vermont. So that seemed like a really great uh, opportunity for people to delve into a sensitive issue. So um, the last time I was here, you asked me, uh, somebody asked me uh, what the number of non-resident library members was, and I told you that I would find out, and so I did. Um, it turns out it's not as easy a question to answer as you would think. Uh, I was able to get a report on the number of non-resident patrons that are currently in our database, and I have this, I have this on the handout for you, so don't feel like I take notes, but um, there's currently 975. However, many of those are no doubt expired, um, and the system would not give me a report of how many of those users are expired or up to date on a given date. So I also generated a figure of how many have joined or renewed their non-resident memberships in the last three years to get a sort of a more narrowed down picture of it, and that number is 133. Um, you also asked me how our library compares with other libraries. And I couldn't remember if that was a question that was specific about non-resident users or just more of a broad question. Um, so I did prepare um, a list of, um, let's see, a list of other, other libraries that charge non-resident fees and what those are. And that's on your handout. So you can take a look at how we are compared to other, other libraries. Um, I also included a link to the report that I mentioned when I first sat, sat down that all the libraries do in January and give to the Department of Libraries. They collate all of that data into a big spreadsheet. And I included the link to that spreadsheet um, or to the page with the spreadsheet on here so that if you, if you have a mind to, you can go and look at that spreadsheet and see um, how Waterbury compares in all sorts of statistics, including programming and staff and budget and all those kinds of things um, to other, li other public libraries in Vermont. And you can sort it by geographic area, or you can sort it by um, the size of the population served, and so on. So it's a really handy tool. And with that, I will close, unless there are any questions. Call me. Your um, non-resident fee is ten. Wait. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, it's ten dollars right now. Ten dollars per person, right? Yes. Okay. And but that does not. You don't charge children, right? That's correct. So, um, in the budget, I have a budget for a budget report. We've taken in seven hundred and ten dollars this year so far in non-resident fees. So that means seventy-one adults have paid so far this year the budget is twenty two hundred dollars last year i think we took in about twenty three or twenty four hundred so um, thank you it's kind of on pace to be what we were last year i think okay. and that's for one year right that, that yes. resident fee one, is one year, one yep. year. how do you get your number of visits do you have a counter at the door or 
Right. We have a we have an electronic counter, and there's one at the at the door where you come in from the larger parking lot, and there's also one inside the library uh, on the, these doors here that that from the hallway into the library do on the s- other side of our doors. Do you have some sort of fudge factor for people who like go out to the car to get a you know candy bar or something? Yeah. Well, there's a number of reasons why it's not a perfect science. Right. Um, we, of course, the staff usually uses the um, the door to the sal room, uh, which doesn't have a counter on it, but um, sure, we have we have people that might make multiple trips. We have, you know, the, the mail delivery person who comes every day, and right. we have, um, you know, some of the staff some of the staff go in and out our door from the other side of the building. On the other hand, we also it, it's also set the counter is set about this high, mm-hmm. so it misses all the children who are below that height. Yeah. So I mean, I can't tell you that that's an exact wash, but the important thing is to look at the trends. Um, and the trend since the new building opened is is a J curve. I just want to make a comment over the sure. last few years. I think that especially the interactive talks and stuff like that have been much improved. So, oh, good. Uh, I think I've I've where I wasn't attending a lot of library programs. I've actually been in the library oh, a few good. times. We, we try to make sure that we are presenting programs that are going to appeal to people with different interests. So that, I'm glad to know that that's worked. That's real important because I know you used to never see very much on hunting, fishing, you know, kind right. of outdoor kind of activities. And mm-hmm. now, you know, even there's even hunter education, which I'm pretty, I think that's pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you for the comment. Right. I'll pass that on to Judy. So while I was sitting here think, listening to you, uh, give your presentation here tonight <clears throat> what came into my head was are you sure you're operating our library or are you operating uh, all th- all things for all people it mm-hmm. sounds like uh, the scope has gotten real broad over time here uh, that's good to see because obviously people are you know some people are benefiting from it um, the statistics link um, is that generated by statistics that each library sends in correct okay and it's just collated into one great big spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate your observation, Chris, because you're right that libraries in this day and age are no longer warehouses of books. Yes, of course we have books in, in a variety of formats, um, but the, the sort of, in, in our business, what we talk about is being community centers and community hubs with lots of things going on that support um, an active and interesting community and that support literacy in all different ways and lifelong learning in all different ways. So keeping on that theme, what, what does the library need 21 snowshoes for? <laughs> 21? Well, did you say that you got a grant to get, I thought you said 21 sets I'm sorry, of snowshoes. the grant was for $1,200 and we're going to be buying nine pairs of snowshoes right. of various sizes for people to borrow and check out just one, but that's okay. Oh. I, I'm sorry if I misspoke. I, the grant was for 1,200 and change. The bigger question is yeah. why does the library need snowshoes at all? Okay. I'm not criticizing. I'm just wanting to ask that. Okay. So libraries are more and more collecting what we call non-traditional items, and our telescope that hopefully some of you heard about is is one example of of that, um, and. So the snowshoes is an idea I brought with me from Franklin County. We had um, an organization called Rise Vermont, which started off just in Franklin County, and I believe now they're, they're trying to expand statewide. But they are all about supporting healthy choices and healthy activities in, in the communities that they operate in. And they offered a grant to all the libraries in Franklin County for nine pairs of snowshoes, and most of us took them up on it. Um, and so. The, the nice thing about being able to borrow a pair of snowshoes from your li- local library is if you have, say you have guests coming to town and you want to all go out on the trail, you can borrow some snowshoes for them. Uh, let's say you're a family with young kids and you don't really know if it's going to be worth the investment. Is everybody going to like snowshoeing? Maybe, maybe not. So you can borrow them from the library and try them out and see if you like them. Yes, ever. Just very quickly, not criticism, but a recommendation. I'm Everett Coffey, and I would encourage that when you have a speaker like this, 
somebody watch it on channel 15 and 17, the meeting, other than being the library director, doesn't know the name or what her real title is. So when they speak, if they would say, I'm Mary Smith and I'm the library director or the program director, I think that would be helpful for people watching that don't have an idea who this lady is. Can I do it now or is it too late? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm Almy Landauer and I'm the director of the Waterbury Library. I started on uh, basically September 1st. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one quick uh, question. I, I, I appreciate you coming out tonight, and and I think the library is definitely on a good a good path. Um, with the non-resident fees, can you remind me, is there an option where they can actually buy a pass that, this is a per visit fee, right? No, that's an annual fee. Okay, so it's $10 for a non-resident to be able to use a library. To, have, to get a library card, yes. And is that, that's, it seems like we're on the low end of the average, obviously. Yes, we are. Um, is that something that you have talked about raising, and, and where, where is that sweet spot of? Yeah, I have talked about it with the staff, and I'm planning to talk about it with the commissioners to see, to get their take on it and what they think. Um, the Department of Libraries recommends, and I think it was actually a requirement in the uh, standards when they before they stop, kind of stop doing the standards. They're revamping them. Anyway, that's another story. Um, they, they highly recommend that you don't have your non-resident fee higher than the per capita support that you're getting from your town. And I, I think there's, there's probably maybe two on that list that are anywhere close to their per capita support. Um, so, so we have a lot of room that we could go up, um, but on the other hand, it would be quite a shock to people for it to triple or quadruple in one year. Sure. So most likely, if the commissioners do decide to raise it, it would be incremental, would be my guess. I uh, notice on your new patrons here, uh, your little chart, um, 2015 is 196, and 2016 was 551. <clears throat> then it drops substantially for 2017 there. Um, you must have an idea why that happened. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that it was the excitement of the new building that brought a lot of people in that first year. And now it's sort of leveled off to sort of our new normal. When was the Stowe Library out? Weren't they out of commission here? They still are. They're yeah. planning on reopening May 1st. And I think we had about, uh, I'm going to guess, I haven't looked lately, but I think we had maybe about 40 Stowe people come in and get cards here for the duration of the period where it was closed. And then if they want to continue that once the Stowe Library opens, then they will pay the, the non-resident fee. We gave them a, we gave them a... Um, Incentive? <laughs> a, well, we gave, we gave them a free membership while their library was closed, figuring they would do the same for us if we were... From anybody? Thank you again for your time, and I will see you in the next quarter. Yeah, we appreciate it. Tell me. Thanks. Thank you. Do I leave this on? Yeah, I'm sure Ann's got plenty of batteries. <laughs> okay, Barb. A little overview on the emergency management plan. Thank you. Um, I'm Barb Farr, and I wear a number of different hats in the community. Um, tonight, I'm wearing the hat of um, preparing the emergency management plan. And every year, uh, there is a new plan that's required by the state to be on register. And there are a number of things that when communities adopt their plans, they are eligible for certain incentives, <clears throat> meaning um, if there's a disaster, a federally declared disaster, and funding becomes available and Waterbury has had some damage, you get a higher percentage of um, a match. The town is responsible for a 25% match. And if you have an approved plan or an adopted plan, um, the state will pay half of that match. So, and then with other grants, you're eligible for hazard mitigation grants, buyout grants, other, other grants as they become available. So um, this, is, this year there is a new format for the plan which is different from prior years. And um, this plan that's in front of you is following that 
um, format that's been requested. So a couple things since you received the draft last Friday. Um, as of this morning, um, Bill Sheplock, um, we learned that uh, Bill Woodruff, who's been the emergency management director, um, we knew all along that he's been building a house and going to be moving out of town, um, but um, he is no longer going to be the emergency management director, so we had a very brief conversation, and um, it's me, if you approve. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> um, anyway, I think most of you know my history with emergency management. Um, and so I am glad to fill in, although I think I got the short end of the stick on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I did change that on the cover page, well, on the um, information that's in here, the contacts that are in here. And there is a cover page that if you approve the plan, um, you will have to sign it, Chris, saying that the, on behalf of the select board that you've approved it. And then Bill will also have to sign it. It goes to the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission <clears throat> for their review, which they've already um, tentatively approved it, it's all set to go, and then it goes to the state, and the state has requested these to be in by May 1st. So um, that's one change, the emergency management director. Second, uh, it's not really a change, but it is a change for this plan because it was never in any of the old ones, but we had an internal discussion about if there's a disaster, and this becomes our new emergency operations center, um, and the select board isn't meeting for another week or two. Um, if Bill Sheplock's out of town on vacation, and you know, just a number of things. If in an emergency situation, um, can the emergency operations center director, whoever, and it may be Bill, but can that person have the authority to make up to $5,000 worth of um, request for, could be anything, could be for truckloads of um, gravel, it could be for mutual aid, it could be uh, for dumpsters, it could be any number of things, and have that ratified at the next select board meeting. So that's language that was in the draft plan that you got, it's in here, it's a change from um, current practice on, I think staff have an, have an allocation of up to 500 um, yeah, with your so approval. Yeah, so right now the purchasing policy that we have in place requires department heads to get a purchase order signed by me if they're going to be purchasing more than $500 of any single purchase. Um, we're already talking internally about maybe that should, it's been $500 for 15 years and maybe we should raise that a little bit. But certainly for emergency management purposes, it's not a problem as long as I'm here. I, I would sign whatever purchase order. I have the authority uh, by statute to make any purchases uh, for the town, in the name of the town. But if I'm not here, then you know, you're know you stuck with the policy. So I think 5,000 is a reasonable number at this point. Okay. So that's a new one. So um, with that, if this is approved, that language will then go into an updated and revised purchase po purchasing policy for the town as a general policy moving forward at a future date. Um, this will be, if, uh, if you approve it tonight, <clears throat> what I'll do is ask Carla if she can put it on the website so that the emergency plan is available for the general public to see, which we've done in the past. Um, I would ask that the section that deals with private phone numbers for 24-7 contact information come out so that that part is not posted. Um, just, it's, it's a personnel or personal type issue. It would only be used under emergency purposes by? Yes, those who need to use it during an emergency for contacts. Um, same thing with the school crisis plan. We have a copy of um, an older Thatcher Brook, uh, I think it's two years old, school crisis plan. They've got 24-7 um, contact phone numbers in there, and that is going to be an attachment, or it'll be a resource to this plan, but it will be something that's not published because of the, the personal information there. 
Does anybody have any questions on the plan? I was just going to ask you that other than what you've spoke about, there's, uh, have, there hasn't been anything substantial that's changed then? No. It's, um, the plan itself has changed a bit and they're... Um, how it's structured, you mean? Right, how yeah. it's structured. So the information, well, the plan, the way that we would operate is still the same. But there's a little bit more structure to an incident command system structure in the way the state's looking at how they'd like to move forward. Um, so we, they have asked for, well, who is likely to fill positions in a community? And right down to, you know, naming the name, <coughs> what's their phone number and contact information. So um, we've included that in here. And before we were kind of like, well, we'll find somebody. We know who it will be, but we're not going to put it in the plan. Now it's in the plan. And uh, Chris, you'll see your no name in the plan. <laughs> As a, you know, in, in the yep. select board, we would imagine if we got to a point where we had to have volunteers in here and we really had a critical need like with Irene, that all of you at some point would perform some kind of a, a, a valuable function for the operation of the town. Um, we've got Bill in as the um, public information officer and sort of the voice for the community who would be communicating both at the local level, the state level, and to federals, federal level if we had um, a large enough emergency that we needed to get federal aid and federal assistance in here. Um, we would have a communication team as part of that role where we would also, part of the rest of the team would be doing social media outreach, um, making sure that the papers, Front Porch Forum, um, Facebook, everybody would know what's going on. So that's a little bit more specific than what we had in the past. Minor um, issue. Uh, is there both a emergency management coordinator and director? Well, there was. Okay. <laughs> so in the plan that you got before, um, Bill Woodruff was the emergency management director, and I was the emergency management coordinator because I'm trying to um, get back away from that hey. role. And um, as of today, that switched. So um, Bill Woodruff will still remain a critical piece of um, the whole emergency response for infrastructure, public works, and all that. But he won't be the EMD. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Bill, and we won't have an emergency yeah, coordinator. Because the way it's written now is it has you as coordinator in one spot and director in another spot. Yeah. It's so. Is that the plan as of today? Right. Which, oh, okay. That's the one you to, just handed out. All right. I'll have to go and check that. And just because, you know, re, just reading through it when we had this, it gets confusing because it, it then refers, to, it talks to you about you as being emergency management coordinator, mm -hmm. but then it goes EMD and, you know, it really doesn't define EMD, which yeah. I knew it's emergency That's management director, but someone reading this, you know, yeah. it's a minor thing. Okay. I just want to say it's a really good, because I worked a lot with FEMA in my uh, professional job, and this is a pretty good plan. Oh, good. I think Thank you. I think, think you did some good thought on. Thank you. It, I'll, I'll take one more breeze through it and make sure that we've got consistency with that. Yeah, that's always a, a problem, readability, because yeah. you really want the right lines of authority. Yeah. Thank you. So is the reason that Bill... Woodruff is not holding that position because you have to be a resident of the town, is that? You don't have to be a resident of the town. Um, or does he just it, wish not to do it? A little bit. He was pretty happy. A little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> I, we had a short discussion on that this morning. I don't know, Bill, how you feel? Well, I was under the impression that he couldn't be. He, he could be, but he was, I guess he was told on Friday, and I wasn't here for that, for some of the other appointed positions for the town, that he'd no longer be eligible right. for those. Nice. Um, and there was, I think, an assumption made that, oh, okay, well, I can check that one off as well. So that's what led to the discussion this morning, and, and uh, we could put him back on. That would, that would, if you'd want to. I mean, he'll still be here. He'll still be playing a critical role. Um, he's pretty much your, um, your fill-in when you're not here anyway, and he's got that authority. So there would be, yeah. 
I didn't know if he was even considering if re if retirement was on the table as well no. at this point. No, no Woodruff, <laughs> you can't retire before I retire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he may end up going stir crazy like my wife did anyway. So yeah. All right. Well, if everybody's all set with that, good um, job. Thank you. What kind of motion do you need? Um, just a motion to approve. And adopt the plan as proposed with the um, edit tweaks. Okay. I, I move that we approve the uh, local emergency management plan dated April 15, 2019, with uh, minor uh, editorial changes. Is there a second to that? I'll second that. Any more discussion? I feel like you had a question there, Mark. No, my mic's red, so I'm going to oh, see oh. I'll, um, I'll okay. pull it up in a second. No further comments or questions. Uh, all that wish to approve the emergency management plan, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Thank you for passing that over. Yep. Um, did you want a quick update on Main Street? Absolutely, would love it, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll take care of it. Um, so just quickly with my other hat on um, as the uh, transportation liaison with the transportation projects in Waterbury and VTrans, uh, most of you have noticed that there has been some start of activity. There has not been an official start to the uh, digging on Main Street yet, which should start up hopefully next week or so. Um, they've been doing some drainage work. They've been doing the tree cutting. Um, getting ready, putting the sign package up, getting ready for the soil deposit area that's right up off of um, the interchange that's going to go towards the, uh, it'll be, when they're digging up the soil and they need to put it somewhere, it's going to go where the southbound entrance to I-89 used to be. Is that up by Armory Drive? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. So you have seen some work up there. Um, interesting note of all the trees that came down, about 99% of all people who have ha had expressed concern, um, you know, what's going on, oh my gosh, the trees are coming down, they were from out of town, people from out of town. Duxbury, Moortown, Hyde Park, Montpelier, the list goes on. So it was uh, really, there was one person from Waterbury and that was it. Were they just not uh, aware of the fact that Main Street was being reconstructed? or I think that has a lot to do with it. They were people who uh, either traveled through Main Street because of their job, um, or they actually work in downtown and were surprised to see the trees. Do you need another battery? No, I'm good. Okay. So, um, yeah, it, it's coming along. They should start doing the um, ground, well, breaking ground right on Main Street. As probably most of you know, they're going to start at uh, Park Street, which is right by Rusty Parker Park, and head south out of town that way. That'll take place all of this year, um, this summer, and into the fall. They will start doing some work. Um, we call it Segment 2. The way that the plans were initially developed, this was Segment 1 from here to Stowe Street. Segment 2, Stowe Street to um, Batch Elder. No, Park Borough. Park, yes, yeah, right in between there. Park Street to Batchelder and then Batchelder to Demerit. So they're working on segments three and four, um, primarily this season and a little bit on segment two, right around um, Prohibition Big and Elm Street in the fall, late summer, fall. And when they are done with their work this year, all of section th uh, segments three and four will be paved over. They'll have new sidewalks and the infrastructure will, infrastructure will be in. And then next spring, about a um, little bit um, later than now, they'll go back in and plant the trees um, that are scheduled to go in next spring. So segments three and four will be done. And then they'll start back on finish segment two and then segment one next year. So they'll be bringing the well, the material that they pull out of the ground there. They'd be bringing it down Armory Drive then. No, they're going to go up on the it. interchange. Oh, they're going to dump it over the bank from up the, on yep. the, up above. So they've opened that guardrail. Um, guardrail that's there. They've got barrels, and we had a discussion last week. Well, you know, we've got to be real clear that people are not to follow those trucks in there. 
because um, we don't want that to happen. So I'm, it's not clear at this point if they're going to have uh, flaggers to open up um, that area when the trucks come in. For right now, they're anticipating maybe one truck a day for the next three weeks, and then after that, there's going to be, you know, it's going to ramp up. So how are they going to, I can see going up the ramp and driving in there, they'll dump their load and turn around, and I'm or will not they back sure. out, or they back out and... Uh, I don't think, they have said they're not going to come hairpin. down Armory Drive, but that they're going to come back out and somehow make that corner and then come down Stowe Street. So well, take a right, a pretty, right. Pretty sharp hairpin there. It's a sharp hairpin, and I'm, it'll be interesting to see how they do that. Yeah, they, yeah, they got it figured out. I'm sure they can do it. Yeah. I had kind of an off-the-wall question back to the trees. <laughs> um, uh, w was there any, or would it be possible to talk to, I, I think it was Potter that took down most of those trees, um, to get a sense of how, what the health of the trees w were that were taken down, just yeah. as, as we get further and further into, you know, having these diseases and beetles and infestations going on throughout the state, I'd just be interested to know if there were any, you know, if there was any pathology done afterwards to say, you know, this, so, this amount of trees were. Affected. Yeah, so, so Jane Brown really is the person who evaluated the trees before they came down. Okay. Um, along with there was a state historic preservationist, there was an arborist, and there was a team of people who evaluated the trees for their health, for their root system impacting the infrastructure, and um, right of way, what, where were they in there? Um, the anecdotal story that I didn't hear directly from Potter, but I heard from the construction crew who did hear it from Potter, that about half the trees were diseased and rotting on the inside, um, roughly half. So. Uh, um, so that's that's third hand that I'm telling you that. Um, the one tree of interest that has sparked a lot of interest is the uh, big red oak tree that came down at 131 South Main Street. Um, and Everett, you gave me a call on that tree. There, Jane Brown was very interested. In the, any, anyway, um, Chris was interested in the tree. So there have been a lot of meetings. That tree has been saved. And uh, either tomorrow or Wednesday, there's a gentleman that owns a sawmill, uh, the largest, the one that can saw the largest logs in the state. And he specializes in large heirloom trees. Mm -hmm. This is considered a large heirloom tree and a quick um, scan of the rings in the tree indicate that it's about 143 years old, which would make it planted, uh, had been planted around 1876 which would have been a hundred years, a hundred year anniversary from 1776, the founding of our country. Um, the terminology, I believe, is a, a century oak, or a centennial oak, yep. So, and I didn't learn until today that it's the only red oak that was on Main Street. Huh. So, anyway, um, we're preserving that tree and having discussions, Chris is part of that discussion, um, about how do we really honor that tree and how do we how do we tell the story of that tree so that's in the works hmm. um, want to add to that no I, my question was is there a sense of what type of tree is going to be replanted in along main street of every there um there is a um at, if you go on to waterburyworks.com each of the segments is on there and each of the segments shows where the new trees are being planted. Um, if we go back to the plans, it tells exactly what type of tree will go into that place. So there is a plan that's out there, and it varies between um, deciduous trees. Um, we've got some evergreens. We've got um, flowering plant trees. So there's an assortment. Yeah, I've just wondered from a disease perspective, you know. I think that was all taken into consideration, yeah, I, I but suspect I, it probably was. I wish Jane were here to speak to that because yeah. I wasn't part of that. Yep. Next time. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do you, anything else? Nope. Nope. I'm going to give you this. And nope. switch that one Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah. Alrighty. Next thing on the agenda is to um, choose a trustee for the Waterbury Ambulance Service. Um, 
been doing a little bit of thinking about how to handle that deal. Um, it's uh, come to mind that, in all fairness, I think that the uh, choice should be done by paper ballot. It's not an easy choice. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to have to sit in these chairs to make a choice like that. Both candidates were um, were very qualified. Um, so to save hard feelings amongst the public or whatever, I think uh, on behalf of the board, it'd be the best that we just did it by paper ballot, if that's OK with the rest of you. Does anybody wish to have any discussion ahead of time or based on last week? Chris? Yes, sir. Everett Coffee. Um, maybe it would be better for the people watching it on channel 15 or 17 if they knew how this came about. Because now Mortown and Duxbury, I believe, each has a trustee on the board of trustees. We, we covered that all at the last meeting. So yeah, it was, all, it was all discussed at the last meeting. All, there, they were here Apparently when they were here. Apparently I wasn't here. Um, anyway, am I correct? There will be two members from one of the towns to make the total of seven. That's correct. One will be elected by the, the um, ambulance um, members themselves, and the other one is appointed by or elected by us. Sorry, I missed the meeting. Yep, yep. Okay. There's a tie, we're going to be in a little predicament. Do I have some votes? Sure, we've got it. By a vote of three to one, the trustees selected Sally Dillon. Okay, very good. good. All right. That was hopefully relatively painless. Uh, I want to thank Mike, Frank, for certainly coming in and offering to be uh, one of the trustees. Uh, maybe there's some, something else that he might be interested in that I'm sure that uh, we'd love to have him on as a volunteer. And congratulations to Sally. Okay. Uh, next thing on the item on the list is uh, to consider an entertainment permit for music in the alley. And, well, the outside consumption permit for... Um, Stagecoach in, right? Mm -hmm. we'll start with the uh, so, music in the alley first. Um, Whitney Eldridge from Axel's Frame Shop has been doing music in the alley for several years. <laughs> the difference this year is that there's no more village. She used to call out a, a village entertainment permit. So um, I suggested that she fill out a town entertainment permit and that it would have to be approved by the board. Her four dates are June 28th, they're all Fridays, July 26th, August 9th, and August 23rd. And they run from, I think, 6 to 9. Okay. Would you mind giving those dates again, please? June 28th, July 26th, August 9th, and August 23rd. And she's also coordinated with the Black Bag to do some catering, which I have the authority to approve. All right. Somebody wish to make a motion to uh, approve an entertainment permit for music in the alley uh, with the dates that were suggested? I'll make that motion. Is there a 
second? I'll second the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Just one quick thing is August 9th, is that the weekend of the car show? I think it is. I don't know if that's, and I don't know also with the whole construction rerouting, is there going to be kind of any issue there? Probably not, but. Can't speak to that. Well, that, I mean, if you have a question and you're concerned that it might be too much, you can approve the other three and then get more information. All right put that last one on the agenda for a future meeting. Well, to me, it, it just might be where they, I think they're going to have to do a rerouting of the parade for the uh, antique right. car show, so. Right, well, the, parade, the the car show starts on Friday, but the, the parade last parade year was on Saturday. Saturday, right. So this would be a Friday night. Oh, oh that, those are Friday nights, okay. Yeah, yeah and the, I've, I've actually uh, participated in this event. Um, it's in the alley completely. It's not on the street at all, so it's not it doesn't okay. really interfere too much with traffic all, at all or anything. All these dates are Fridays. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So we got a motion. Motion and a second. Um, all those who wish to approve the motion, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, outside consumption permit for stagecoach in. So we've already approved his liquor license, but he inadvertently mailed his outside consumption permit directly to DLC. So they have mailed it back to me for your approval. Okay. So for motion for that, we'll take care of that as well. I'll make that motion. Second? Second. All right. Well, all those in favor say aye. 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 Good. Manager's items. Fire department, <coughs> Easter parade. Yeah, this is on the agenda because there was a little bit of uh, mix up, I think. I, I don't really think you need to do anything, um, but since it's on the agenda. Uh, the Rotary Club sponsors uh, an Easter parade. They've been doing it for 25 years plus. Kids march from the school down Stowe Street to Main Street and uh, then down to uh, Park Row and then into over Nashville Park where they have the Easter egg hunt. And, um, you know, it was formerly uh, the Waterbury Police Department provided uh, escorts and everything else for it in years past. A year ago, the police department was already gone. The Easter parade went off without a hitch. Um, they have volunteers from the Rotary Club and from the fire department. Somehow word got out, and we got an email from um, Jeff Smith, who's a Rotarian, suggesting that you know there was an issue <coughs> with the fire department and that they couldn't do it, and what was the problem. So we put it on the agenda. But I reached out to Gary last week, and and he said that there was no issue. They already had a number of firefighters who had expressed a willingness to volunteer. So on Friday, I sent an email to everybody and said go forward, you're all set, just like it's been in the past. So you don't have to take any action. All right, vendor ordinance would be the next thing. Yeah, so um, I emailed out to all of you um, uh, a proposed ordinance to regulate vendors. The town um, has an ordinance uh, that was um, passed in the 1990s, uh, 1994, um, and the the town ordinance that was passed in 1994 really spoke to vendors in the parks. It explicitly said that no vendors would be allowed in the Anderson Field where the summer recreation program happens and the and the pool is. Uh, there was provisions to allow people to be vendors in the Dak Road Park or in the Hope Davy Park, um, you know, to provide uh, food during tournaments or what have you. Uh, and it also um, kind of deferred to the village to regulate vending on the village streets 
in other village properties. Um, so the village, as we all know, uh, dissolved on July 1st last year, 2018. <coughs> Before the village dissolved, we took care of adopting a parking and traffic ordinance, which we have to amend again um, just to deal with the speed limits on Route 100, and I haven't got to that yet. But um, I didn't think about the vending ordinance, and it typically doesn't come up. Uh, people last year bought vending permits while the village still existed and, you know, kind of forgot about it. So now, of course, spring is coming, so food vendors are starting to call saying, I want a vending permit. Well, there's no authority to regulate the vendors now because the village is out of business. They can't use that. So the village trustees in 2000, I think it was 2015 or 16, not very long ago, they did a complete uh, um, kind of repurposing of their ordinance. Um, and we had Joe McLean from Stitzel and Page, um, municipal attorney, review the ordinance that the village wrote. He helped uh, actually draft it. And what I sent to you the other day is pretty much the same ordinance that the trustees adopted in 2015 or 16. Uh, I did put in a couple of um, other areas uh, to speak directly to the recreation fields because the village's ordinance didn't regulate that. It specifically excluded them because they were town property and the town had an ordinance. So the ordinance that prohibits, this ordinance still prohibits vendors from Anderson Field and the swimming pool. Um, it would allow vendors um, in the back row field and the Hope Davy field. Um, I know that you didn't get this until just the other day. Uh, if you want to take some time and, and adopt it, read it over, suggest amendments, I think it's pretty much ready to go. The way the law works is that uh, you don't have to have a public hearing for an ordinance. It can just be noticed on the agenda. Um, if you adopt an ordinance, it does not take effect for 61 days. Um, from the time you adopt, there's a, I believe it's a 44 day period. Don't ask me where these numbers come from in the legislator's <laughs> mind. But you adopt an ordinance, um, there's a 44-day period in which a petition can be uh, circulated to call a town meeting to nullify the ordinance that you adopt. Like a rescind? Yeah, uh, but it's a town meeting. So anyway, um, if you adopt this tonight, it won't go into effect until the end of June. Uh, middle of June. Um, if you want to wait uh, a little while more, uh, you certainly can. I don't think we're going to have a run on, you know, people vending. Every year there's people that come in and they're, you know, convinced that they're going to make, um, you know, $50,000 in, in, you know, some huge business that they're going to have and they come three or four times and then they go, you know, <laughs> Julie Roy has been the only long-term vendor that we've had for, and, and that business goes back you know, there were two people before she owned it. Uh, that's really the only stick to it in this that we have. Well, that answers my question then, because I was going to ask you. I did read. I did read through the ordinance. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask you how many people actually took the the whole year's worth of nobody. nobody. So it's just by the by yeah, the by day the or month. by the month. Yeah, and you know that that was the big change that the village had. Um, the, the village for years um, regulated vending through its charter and it was $3 a day. And when that provision was put in the charter back in the 40s or 50s, $3 a day was a lot of money. But by a few years ago, $3 a day was really not much at all. It does, um, this does incorporate the village's language. I think it restricts vendors from being within 100 feet of, uh, of a, a restaurant or another similar business. Uh, what is um, 
not generally understood, and I, and, and I say this because um, it, it applies everywhere, but um, this ordinance really only applies to vendors who are vending on sidewalks, streets, or public parks. If somebody, I had a call last week from a fella who um, wanted to put a hot dog cart up at the Sunoco station up across from Pete's Greens. And I asked him where he wanted it, and you know, well, in the parking lot, I'm gonna make a deal with the guy that owns the property, and so on and so forth. So if, if a vendor sets up on private property, it requires a zoning permit. It's not regulated by the vending ordinance. So it's only vendors who are on streets, sidewalks, or public parks that have to get this kind of permit. If they're, you know, on Mark's property and selling ice cream, that's between Mark and that person and the zoning administrator. But anyway. How does it work, like, for instance, like the 4th of July parade where you see yeah. vendors selling anything from from Cokes to noisemakers and, you know, hats and stuff. Yeah, like it's it's difficult to do that, so... Are they even applying for permits? Yeah, most of the time they don't even come yeah. in. And frankly, when people come in, if somebody comes in and says, you know, I want to I want to um, sell balloons on the 4th of July parade, right. because nobody else is coming, I just say, just go and sell your balloons and the one one day deal, it's no, Independence it's just, Day. Have, yeah, because if you end up charging only the people come in, there's eight people out there who are doing it for free, and that person's paying you whatever. So I just kind of close my eyes on that yeah, on that particular. Probably event. right. Give them an attaboy just yeah. for at least coming in and, <laughs> and asking, you know, trying to do the right, right. thing. <laughs> um, how do the rest of you feel about it? Do you want to take some time to review it? You. Have you reviewed it? Um, you happy with it? Not happy with it? And one last thing before you all answer that question. Um, you, somebody probably brought it. I didn't bring it with me. The, um, the fee structure that goes along with this, and there's a, there's a fee structure for, I think it's a month, 30 days, right? Yeah. So uh, there's a monthly fee, $65, which is valid for 30 consecutive days. There's a seven hundred dollar fee for the whole year, and then for special events, and special events would be like the NQID uh, or something that a um, an organizer is going to have. So, like Ben and Jerry's has had uh, art, pumpkin arts giveaway like and things like that. The yeah arts fest. The people who get that. Uh, special events license. They buy a license. The vendors that show up for those events don't have to get a permit. It's covered under the special yeah, events right. license. Anyway, um, that fee structure is not part of the ordinance. The ordinance specifically allows the select board to establish a fee that's outside the ordinance because if the fee structure was in the ordinance, um, anytime you wanted to change it, it would take 60 days from the day that you did it. So the fee structure says you get to set the fees once a year, and that way we don't have to worry about it going up and down and everything else. But the structure itself, the fee structure itself, is outside the ordinance just so right. we can say that we're going to change the fees and you can just change it. Yep. What's your pleasure, gentlemen? I took a brief look at it. I didn't really study it in depth. Um, I didn't see anything. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty wrong. inclusive, and you know, it was yeah. uh, pretty pretty detailed. Covered, you know, anything that I thought. As I was reading through it, I said, "Is there a, a paragraph in here that covers insurance?" And as as well, there was so that. Uh, Everything else seemed to be well covered, so I didn't have any issues with it. I'm probably going to recuse myself from the vote just okay. so there's no conflict. All right. I think it was comprehensive enough for me. Okay. All right, then. If, um, We'd lock, like to adopt it then. I need a motion to do so to approve the. Uh, I make a motion to approve the vendor's ordinance. Vendor ordinance as presented. Is that? 
All right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 And you're good to go, Bill. So we'll have to, uh, just so you know, we'll have to publish a summary in the newspaper. Uh, you know, it, it's going to summarize a lot of the sections. We don't have to print the whole thing, fortunately, because that would cost a fortune. But it's going to be a little bit more expensive than just a, you know, a simple uh, government notice because it, it has to have certain things in it. So that'll be in, put it probably both in the uh, record and probably put it in the time sequences. Okay. First quarter budget report. Uh, I did not send this out the other day. Um, and you'll see why in a minute. Thanks, Everett, for coming. Um, so I try to, uh, to provide a budget report at the end of every quarter. Um, and uh, so I've done that. But the first quarter is kind of a uh, snoozer. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, we have almost no revenue received by the time the first quarter ends. Uh, so you can see there on the first couple of pages that, uh, you know, out of $2,921,000 of revenue through the end of March, we received 89000 So um, no revenue. Uh, and then the uh, spending is kind of kept at bay because we don't have town meeting until third month of the first quarter and then it takes 30 days before the appeal period goes by. So we try not to do any major spending. Obviously we have to pay people and payroll is our biggest expense anyway. But um, there's really not a lot to report on here. Um, we're, I, I've given you the uh, operating fund budgets. So the general fund, the highway fund, and the library fund, uh, and then a balance sheet. So the general fund, uh, through 25% of the year, uh, we've spent just 11% of uh, the money in the general fund budget. In the highway department, we've received 1.7% of the revenue. So the only revenue that we received was the quarterly installment of the Vermont State Aid to Highways and a couple of the overweight permits. Uh, and then on the spending side, even though, you know, payroll is up about 30% through the first quarter, um, that's very typical of the first quarter. There's generally, that's our biggest quarter for overtime, so they're always a little bit out ahead of themselves in the highway department. So that'd be on page nine when I'm looking at that. Um, just quickly, um, even though the uh, regular pay line is up and the salt line is almost fully spent, and again, Mike, that's, that's normal, um, because we're on a calendar year, um, most of our winter is in the first three months of the year. Um, you know, last year, we kind of had an old-fashioned end of the year where we had snow on the ground and we were spending money, Excuse but me. typically it's usually lately into December before we start spending. We don't have a, a salt storage facility to speak of. We typically, you know, buy salt by the tractor trailer load and it comes in on a pretty regular basis during the winter time. Um, you'll see throughout this budget that there are some things that are uh, spent 50% or 32% um, on kind of a across the board basis. 
Those are our insurances. We pay our health insurance a month in advance. So uh, health insurance in all departments is going to be ahead of, of the calendar. And then um, what we pay VLCT, passive, and the, uh, the verb trust for um, workers' comp, unemployment, and liability insurance. Uh, we've, we've paid 50% of that through the first quarter of the year it's just because we pay that quarterly. The second um, installment is due the first week of April, and just the way the calendar showed up, we paid the April bill at the end of March, so it's, it's showing up here. <coughs> In the highway budget on page 9, one last thing that I'll comment on. The second line there that says part-time pay says we've spent 191% of what we budgeted. And if you look at this page, you'll see, yes, we budgeted $5,000 for part-time pay. We've spent 9,500 already. <coughs> That's a little bit deceptive. Uh, that employee actually works for all three public works departments, two of which are in the Edward Ferrar Utility District. The person's payroll is through, through the town. So, so we don't have to run two different sets of books and give the person two W-2 forms and everything else. Um, a good share of that work is actually for water and sewer, and the water and sewer department will be paying the highway department back. I just haven't got to balance that out yet. So <coughs> what I'm saying is don't worry about that. Um, the library, Almi already gave you kind of a update there. Mark, just to your question, I did a, some quick calculations, and Almi said that you know the non-resident fee, the state library uh, system kind of recommends don't have a fee any higher than your per capita. You know, per capita, I'm not sure that's a great way to measure it, but I did a couple of different things. So you can see at the top of the page. We've approved uh, $484,000 of tax money for the library. And if you divide that by the town's grant list, the library's tax rate is somewhere between six and seven cents. I didn't have the grant list. I, I estimated the grant list, but it's somewhere between six and seven cents. So on a $300,000 property, um, people are paying $202 a year for a $300,000 property for the library. If you, if you do that, uh, 484 on a per capita basis, and again, I estimated the population is somewhere between 5,000 and 5,100, I think. On a per capita basis, it's $95 a year. If you look at the budgeted amount as opposed to the uh, 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 taxes, it's pretty much the same. The, the, the budget is 487. It's actually a few dollars less. I mean, just a three thousand dollars more than the taxes. So, you're on the same thing. A per capita of about 96, and on the tax rate about six cents. So anyway. The, the one thing I noticed on her answer was <laughs> fee. She said, "We'll see what uh, was it the the." Library commissioners were the ones that she was referring to as fees, and the one comment I have there is, you know, I know that they they have their own source of funds separate from us, but it also seems like, you know, to think that the any kind of fee or income is solely based on their decisions, I I, I yeah, find I'm that not, kind of interesting. I'm not sure to hear. that I'm not sure that's really true. Okay. I didn't want to uh, kind of debate with her. the The way I understand the law is that the library commissioners are in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the library and they are in charge of their budget. <coughs> They're in charge of their budget that the town gives them. So the town's appropriation is the tax appropriation. So that's $487,000. So, you know, in the, the way that we've always done it here, and we went through it just a couple of months ago, it's. Uh, kind of a collaborative effort. They show you how they want to spend their budget. They, they put it all in front of you and they tell you what the need is and then there's some debate and you know, can we turn a little here or turn a little there? But what the law says is that 
if the town decides to give the library $484,000, the library commissioners get to decide how to spend it. So they can, you know, if, if you said, we don't want to buy books, well, if you give them any money, they can buy books because they're in charge of how the money is spent. But I think that really, Mark, the way that it works typically here is that the library director clearly works for the commissioners. She would make her recommendations, answer to them. But I think we would ultimately come back here and there would be at least a discussion. Uh, for the longest time, the commissioners didn't want to have a fee at all. And this kind of came to a boiling point a few years ago. Duxbury always used to make an appropriation. They appropriated like $5,000 a year. And <clears throat> Some of the commissioners, Harriet Grenier, Margaret Luce, uh, kind of in particular would say, well, they should be required to pay kind of what we're paying. And if we're having a six cent tax rate for the library, they should pay a six cent tax rate. Kind of how we do with the fire department. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think folks in Duxbury feel that they really need fire department services and the library services aren't quite on the same par when it comes to a need. So a couple of years ago, um, the commissioners did set a, a per capita fee. One of the commissioners in particular felt it was important that non-residents paid something because everybody wasn't from Duxbury and they were the only one that was making an appropriation. We have a fair number of people that come from Bolton and some from Wartown as well. So they, they put the fee in, and then they tried, they went to the Duxbury Select Board, and they tried to get like $10,000 instead of $5,000 from Duxbury. And the Select Board went to the voters, and they let the voters vote on it, and said, you know, if you pass this, we'll send Library $10,000. If you don't pass this, you're going to have to pay $10 a piece to go. And what they told them was, bring your receipt to the town clerk and we'll pay you your 10 bucks back. And they kind of rolled the dice that it'd be, you know, less, less than, than $10,000 uh, worth of uh, membership. So, anyway, but it is a reasonable thing to talk about. And I think ultimately this board can have a role in that discussion. So. Well, similar to what you had spoken about there during budget season, you had suggested that if the board chose not to uh, or chose to cut the library f fund by 50,000 uh, and not <coughs> so-called not uh, finance their new staff member that they could just find it elsewhere well they yeah they could have if you had cut their appropriation by fifty thousand dollars and they really felt the staff person was their most pressing need they could they right. could fund that staff person and then just drop something else off. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the last thing, the last two pages, uh, pages 12 and 13, that's just the general funds balance sheet. And again, this early in the year it is skewed. I will point out, however, on the kind of the middle of the first page, about halfway down on the, under the liabilities, you see tax anticipation note payable. We are borrowing money now to pay current expenses. Um, it's a little earlier this year than we had to borrow last year, and last year was the first year we had to borrow in a long time. And uh, it was the it was the one nice thing that happened with Irene. We had so much, you know, grant money and FEMA money and money coming in for the for this building, the million dollar CDBG grant that we got, and it, it kind of came in in a, in a cash flow fashion that we never had to borrow money for like four or five years, but we're back to kind of normal now. Um, so we are borrowing, uh, that will go up uh, pretty substantially, I imagine, this week, <coughs> uh, just before um, the office closed tonight. I had to do the expense coding sheets for um, Michelle. The interest on all of the bonds, half the interest is due in uh, May, and 
then the interest of principal is due in November. So we're paying, um, I don't know, it's probably 80, $70,000, $80,000 worth of interest in the, this week's orders. Um, so we'll have to borrow a little bit more this week too. Anyway, that's yeah, coming. That's coming from Edward Farrar. That where we're getting. Right now, it is. Yeah, um, and as long as they have cash available, we'll borrow from from them just to keep it local. Right. Uh, if you have to go outside to the uh, bank, we will obviously have to. Do just a small item, Bill. Yeah. Um, in the highway department, under. There was a budget item for chloride in it. No, it's zero. Has it been an administrative thing to not apply chloride to the roads? Uh, we yeah, or is chloride, it just for summer? Summer yeah, chloride. chloride is just for dust control. Yeah, yeah. In the summer, so we don't we don't use any. We use salt. I know sometimes some use for winter. Yeah, chloride. we we don't treat our salt. We don't add okay. salt brine or chloride to the salt. The chloride line is it's, all, it's all for dust, dust, dust control. control. Okay, yeah. great. So with that, um, unless you have questions, that's kind of it for now on the budget. Okay. Thank you, everybody. It looks like they're all set. Uh, pending legal and personal issues. Did you had you said something about? And I forgot what it was specific that you mentioned here, but there was another item that you said you hadn't got to that yet. No, you did the outside consumption permit. No, I thought it was something else. Something about Route 100. Hmm? Something about Route 100, I thought. Maybe I'm crazy. No. Boy, boy. Nothing was added in the beginning. I, I don't remember saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. moments. No, I specifically saying that we were talking about something and you said I hadn't gotten to that yet. Uh, I don't know if it was a vendor's ordinance. Oh, yeah, I did, I did say that I hadn't gotten to that yet. What I said was that we had adopted the parking and traffic ordinance back last year because the village was going away. And then at the last meeting that Mark Mateer was still a select board member, he said that we should amend the traffic ordinance to capture the speed limits on Route 100. Okay, that's what I was And I said, I haven't gotten to that yet, so. Okay, I, I, oh, I, so I hadn't gotten to a, amend. I see, it wasn't gotten to it here on the yeah, agenda. it wasn't for tonight, it, it was, I just that haven't, duty. haven't done that. Okay. <laughs> I knew there was something like that. Thanks, John. Yeah, sure. that <laughs> um, so, do we need a mo you got a motion? We're all set there. Uh, I move that general public knowledge of the details of potential litigation involving the town of Waterbury would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. <coughs> so, is there a second to that? I'll second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 I move to enter executive session to consider potential litigation involving the charge of Mr. Oak and KO v. Town of Waterbury and related confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing legal advice to the town and to discuss a personnel issue. Your second for that one. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 So we will move into executive session for the time being. <laughs>